Because let's face it, any sales situation that you're gonna be in, they, they don't go in a straight line anymore. Right, I think if, if you look at one of the biggest things that's changed about B2B selling over the last several years is the degree of complexity and lack of linearity to the process is off the charts now, right? Issue number two is goal misalignment, right? Um, if marketing talks about MQLs, tell them to shut up, right? I mean, that is just not where we should be today. Welcome to Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast we take a deep dive into the world of business to business sales and how businesses can get the most out of their investment in sales people, sales systems and processes, the lifeblood of any thriving organization. Join us as we explore a range of topics as well as speak to some of the industry's thought leaders, vendors, success stories, people who have just won and failed on their journey in business and sales. Before we get started, please do us a huge favor and click subscribe, follow or like wherever you're watching or listening to us. Also, please drop us a comment that you subscribe. We'd love to get to know our audience. In today's show, we're talking to Randy Littleson. Randy is a world-renowned marketing expert. With over 30 years in the game, he's been either the VP of marketing or CMO for some amazingly innovative companies such as Nice In Contact, Conga, Plexera, and Spyglass. Simon and I are talking to Randy about how sales and marketing can work better together. Great salespeople always know how to get the best out of marketing to build a healthy pipeline. So let's jump in. Well, welcome everybody to uh, this latest edition of the Growth Pulse podcast. Uh, Simon, Randy, welcome and uh, good day. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Randy, so excited to have you on the podcast. You know, you and I have worked together before, um, and uh, you know, want to really give a bit of a background to yourself to to our listeners. How did you get to to you know being CMO of some some fan- phenomenal tech companies? What was the journey? Yeah, thanks, uh, Dan. Thanks, Simon. Uh, very glad to be with you. So uh, believe it or not, I got my degree actually out of uh, university in computer science. So um, you know, I've been in software literally my entire career. Um, had a stint. I, I was actually a, a sales engineer. Um, started off in a sales engineering role, moved into product management. Then that became that was usually in marketing and some of the smaller companies I was with broke out as I got into bigger companies. Along the way, I have uh, actually run R&D and professional services for a short stint. I've worked in public companies, private companies, both VC and private equity backed, uh, companies that range from about 30 million all the way up to a multi-billion dollar company of which I was the CMO of a division, public company, NICE, uh, a division that grew from about 260 million to about 800 million in the five years that I was there. So. Sort of, sort of been in a variety of different companies, different spaces as well, from call center technology to sell into IT organizations. Actually, we worked for a CRM company back years ago, so sort of touched different spaces as well. What do you think is the difference between the like the the marketing messages of all those different organizations? Is is the 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 messaging and the methodology different, or, or are they pretty similar? I think it's more similar than different, right? At the end of the day, um, I think the first thing that companies need to do is to identify how you're different. And I learned this many years ago. I worked for a company called Flexera Software at the time, and we were trying to sort of create this new space that ultimately got called software license optimization. So think about, we worked with Procter and Gamble back years ago, for example, you think about Procter and Gamble, they are experts at procuring things, right? They're really, really, really good at it. Mm-hmm. Software is a tricky beast though, right? Because you can be really good at procuring software, but once you get it into the organization, maybe you bought an application, you bought 10,000 seats or whatever, it's really hard to control. Am I using all of it and getting my full value? Am I using more than I'm supposed to? And so this space called software license optimization, we actually helped solve a problem for Procter & Gamble. We saved them $30 million in six months, helping them identify what software they had and how to control that spend, how to get back, how to repurpose and so on. At the time, there was a space called IT asset management. And so one of the big things that we had to do in differentiation was to say that software is very unique and different. It's got a whole set of new problems and it can't just be a check mark in an IT asset management system. You need a dedicated, specific, purpose-built solution around software. 
That was many, many years ago. But I think one of the lessons that comes out of that is, as any company, you've got to be different first to get yourself against the right competitors. Mm -hmm. If we were positioned as a checkmark feature in that IT asset management, we were competing against IBM Tivoli, HP Unisat, I mean, big, yeah. big behemoths that were entrenched in some of the biggest accounts and we, we would have been dead on arrival. So yeah. differentiate first. And then obviously once you get against the right competitors, you've got to be better, right? You, you got to be better against the right competitors. You got to prove that out. So. I think the message in all of that is, is how do you clarify that differentiation and how do you really identify which space that you're in? How do you claim differentiation to get put into that space? And then you've got to have clarity of positioning of how you're better than any of the competitors in solving that problem that, that you've identified and aligned to. And, and that has been pretty consistent across everywhere I've been. Yeah, I mean, I think from from a sales lens, it's an interesting piece because that's the piece we kind of always focus into, which is you've got a problem and I can solve it uh, in a different way than you've thought about doing it before because you're trying to avoid being commoditized. It's just another solution and, and end up in a race to the bottom. Um, but it's interesting hearing you talk about how that, that uh, thought process becomes really core to what you do from a marketing messaging perspective um, at, at a holistic level. So, you know, often as a salesperson, I think that's one of the things we wanted to talk about today, which is really the, the, uh, the similarities and the differences between how marketers and, and salespeople approach a same problem, which is at the end of the day is, you know, finding more customers and selling more stuff. Yep. I think you, as a marketer, you spend a lot of time in, in rooms discussing your individual, uh, messaging, why you different, exactly what you just described. And I think, yeah, one of the challenges from a, I guess, a sales team's perspective is you know, we, we look at you guys in marketing and you're really smart. You come up with creative ideas. Uh, and then I've somehow got to take those creative ideas out into the marketplace and make sense of them at the coalface. Do, do you find the best sellers pick up on that really quickly? Do they take the message verbatim? Do they put their own spin on it? What, what's your advice to, to sellers you know, I guess once marketers have come up with you know, the wonderful differentiation, what, what does a seller do with that? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things to that, right? Um, first and foremost, I think it is really, really important that you have a common positioning and message that gets communicated everywhere. Right. Uh, it is really important because if you dilute that message out, if a CEO goes speaks at a conference and says one thing slightly different than uh, a marketing person speaking at a different conference versus a salesperson, now all of a sudden you've got a diluted message and there's no consistency. Right. You're not you're not getting the leverage out in the marketplace to be consistent. Think about your partners if you've told them slightly different than that. So I think getting that common message down is absolutely essential. Um, exactly how you bring that to life and communicate it. I think there's room for personalization there, right? The stories that you tell, the way that you communicate that message in a way that you're comfortable with, I think is really, really important, right? That's because fine. I don't want to give Dan stories that don't resonate with him, that he can't be comfortable communicating in that. So I think stories is a great way to one, articulate your message, but also as a way to make it comfortable for you, but the same message, right? So you've got the same message. I think the other challenge that I've seen over the years that's really, really true is if you think about most software companies, what do we enable the sales team on most of the time? It's features. And by definition, that creates a problem in that people wanna to dive to the hard deck and start talking features. And Absolutely. we were actually talking before we got on this, right? Is that one of the things you really want to do is to position to people that look, the world is changing and there's a profound change happening that if you don't act to, you're, you're either going to win or you're going to lose relative to that change. So a digital transformation is a great theme, for example, customer experience space that I spent five years in, right? It's a great theme, right? The importance of customer experience right now cannot be understated. And you either adopt that mindset in your organization and, sh and shift your paradigm around that change in the marketplace or else you get creamed. 100%. That's not a feature function thing to start with. That's a paradigm shift in the market, right? And so 
that level of messaging and getting that conveyed. And then ultimately you do need to show how you're the ones that can help do it, but you got to lead with that to get, get people bought in. That does not come easy to all salespeople because, and, and the company reinforces against that because we keep training on features all the time. So I think there is a time and a place for both of those, right? You, you've got to get that higher level message, that higher level differentiation and what makes you unique in the marketplace. And then there's a time for features and capabilities, which is a part of your solution that you actually deliver that, but you don't lead with that, right? You, you lead with that higher level story and, and then you get down to that. And I think we as organizations often fail because we constantly just keep hitting on the feature messages and, and don't tie it back to that overall and don't educate and enable people on how to tie those two together. Give them stories that help them get comfortable with how they can articulate the message in a way that resonates for them. You put those together and I, I think you can make. I was, gonna say, I was gonna say, Dan, I'm gonna bring up one of your favorite topics here. Cause I think, um, you know, Randy, you're, as a CMO, um, you know, your job is to help facilitate the message within the organization. So you've got consistency across regions, across geographies, roles, as, as you say, partners need to know. Um, one of the things I see um, global corporate marketing teams come out with on a relatively frequent basis is, is the concept of the, uh, the pitch deck. Um, and this is a, you know, a global set of slides that talks to what we do, why we're different, et cetera. And I know I'm going to actually ask this question of Dan. I mean, this is your, your favorite thing in the world, right? When you're sitting there with a, a sales team, you've got 20, 30 um, guys and girls sitting there ready to go and you know, smash their numbers for a year. And uh, corporate comes out with a, a pitch deck that, uh, you know, in our experience is, is probably fairly culturally aligned to North America. Um, you've also got, um, you know, 80 slides in there that you're supposed to go deliver superbly. Um, typically, you'll have a, a chief revenue officer that wants everybody certified. Um, Dan, tell me about your uh, your love of the uh, the corporate pitch deck. Yeah, I, th I think this is a really, <laughs> and I, I love your opinion on this as well, Randy. Like, I think it's a really interesting problem that you have in any size organization. And, you know, the, kind of the topic of this of this conversation, we've had a sales and marketing work together. But when, when you put kind of the sub parts of the business into that conversation as well obviously i've got an operations team i've got a delivery team um from selling boxes then i've got a um, a distribution team who want to understand that it's, you know different product is going to different types of retailers or or wholesalers or um then i've got a product marketing team and i've, I've got a, um, a development all of these people want their part to their messaging in what we're talking about and at the end of the day you, you take these decks that become blown or these messaging pieces that become blown out over a period of time. And really the job of it, I've always experienced the job of a salesperson is to disseminate the information. How do you take all this messaging and simplify it right down to the point where a singular customer can understand in their own context, what can you do for me that makes my life, business, customer's life, whatever it is, better tomorrow than what it is today. And that super simple thought process of what will be better tomorrow than what it is today so often doesn't come out of these, you know, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago, Randy, these feature function developments of stuff that we built and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the, the bit that always jumps me out and punches me in the nose saying, hey, listen, what I really want to know is the five customers that did something amazing last year. Just tell me that. Tell me how a customer actually made these things live, because um, I know for, for especially for for all the you know the listeners that are, that are in the APAC region, our biggest challenge is we don't have enough people. We've only got twenty six million people in Australia, and that's like half of California. So I think it's less than half of California, right? So the the ability to have these companies that are doing just the frequency of things overseas is so much more. And, you know, my, my biggest thing, and, and you know, you're probably cringe hearing me say this, Randy, but take these decks and be willing to kind of tear them up, but tear them up and put them back together again in terms of what is, what is it you can go and do and what, you, what can you actually deliver with the time and effort you've got available? I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, well, you guys probably won't be surprised that I'm a believer in a pitch deck. H however... I think what Simon articulated is what goes wrong with them a lot of times. He's absolutely right. I've seen that be the case, right? Where, you know, you've got 40 slides and you expect people to memorize 40 slides. That's crazy, right? To me, a good pitch deck is 
a dozen ish slides, right? Somewhere in that area, right? It's real short and sweet. It's, it's how do I get that standardized message out to lay a foundation? Because let's face it, any sales situation that you're going to be in, they, they don't go in a straight line anymore, right? I think if, if you look at one of the biggest things that's changed about B2B selling over the last several years is the right. degree of complexity and lack of linearity to the process is off the charts now, right? I mean, we've all seen the statistics of the amount of research that's done before they even engage with us somewhere around 70% or something like that, right? We know that there's a lot of buyer personas that get involved. Uh, I saw research recently, right? If you've got less than a $50,000 average deal size, you get about seven people in your buying committee. From 50 to 250, it's about 10 people in your buying committee. And above 250 in deal size, it's like 19 people in your buying committee. So that's a lot of different personas and constituents that you've got to be able to reach, right? And be able to speak to them and, and address their concerns in that. The buying process is very complex. I do think there's a role for a very concise deck that lays the foundation of what your core positioning and differentiation is. Knowing full well that from that point on, it could fork in a million different directions and there's no way to have a standard deck for that. And even in this condensed pitch deck that I'm talking about, the dozen-ish slides, there's probably, there should be some customer slides in there that should be 100% module so that you can pick from a library that based on my geo, maybe based on the vertical, I mean, I'm going to pick relevant stories. I'm not going to be in A and Z and pick stories that are only from the UK, right? Or from the US or whatever. I'm going to pick local stories, which again, if you're getting started is harder to do, but that those are just scale challenges in that, right? So I do think it's important that you have the ability to localize it in that context. I do think it's important that you have that standard foundational capturing that core differentiation message. What's the major trend in the market that we can help you with? What is our unique view on that and the capabilities that we can bring? Excuse me. And then, you know, some validation that we can actually do that. If you can lay that foundation consistently in the various meetings that you have and then fork off and start addressing the specifics of the circumstance in that, I think there's value in that. But it, it's not a 80 slide deck, 40 slide deck that you're expecting people to memorize and everything. I think you can get into bigger decks that are module that you can pull from so that reps don't have to create on their own. But that's a modular sort of reference deck to me that's different than sort of this initial pitch deck. Yep. Yeah. So going back to the core of this question then, which is how does sales and marketing work better together? In, in that instance, because, you know, again, we've all seen it, whether it's a pitch deck, whether it's, you know, a, a release deck or whatever, you know, people get into this problem of there's too much information there. What in your experience has been kind of the, the behaviors that, you know, on either side of the equation, um, the, the divisional leaders or, the, or the, the, the marketing, you know, the sales and marketing people at the ground level actually put in place to get a get the best outcome like how do they yeah when, when it you've goes wrong when it goes right, like what are the together? things that you've seen that had the biggest impact so i've seen it work together and <laughs> i've seen it not work together to, to your point well, you know I, I, think that's I have true. seen it a couple of times i've seen it and, the core, and opinion, i think I there's a couple of things where yeah. things can go wrong right Number one is if you look at sales and marketing, one of the biggest points of friction is the time horizon difference. If you think about a sales role, the time horizon justifiably and understandably is very short term. You're worried about this month or this quarter and how you're gonna get deals across. And that should be your priority. That's what you get paid on. That's what the company needs. That, that is the priority. Yeah. That has a tendency to really focus the energy, right? Very short term. If you think about marketing, on the other hand, while we do want marketing helping and supporting that as well, marketing's time horizon yeah. is much longer in the general sense, right? Marketing is trying to, if you really think about what we're trying to do, is we're trying to condition the market to be predisposed to buy our stuff, right? You're trying to identify those people that are in market. You're trying to build awareness with them, and you're trying to you know, move them along in the process in our direction in that. That tends to be building awareness, things like that. Those are longer term propositions. 
that tends to be the source of a lot of frustration. And so I think one, the more that you, like any problem, right? The more that you're cognizant and aware of that, the more that you can be in tune with that and ah, okay, I, I get it. I think it's incumbent upon marketing to do a better job of educating as well, right? There are things that we do, thought leadership, analyst relations, press relations, you know, speaking opportunities, awareness oriented, things that are more on the awareness spectrum that may not have that short-term dividend. But I think we can all agree that the more times we walk into an account and they know who they are, that who we are, there's awareness that we've built over a period of time in that, we're, that's gonna be good for us, right? But too often, it's like everything that we do in marketing is expect to have that short-term outcome. And I don't think we always do a good job of educating that, look, this is actually planting seeds for the future. And here's the reason why that's important. In, in, right? So that's issue number one. I think issue number two is goal misalignment, hmm. right? Um, if marketing talks about MQLs, tell them to shut up, right? I mean, that is just not where we should be today, right? Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. When I joined uh, in contact that became nice in context, we got acquired by nice. I, I did a sort of listening tour in my first several you know, weeks there. And I met with you know, lots of people in sales, sales leadership, individual reps and everything. And I, I heard a couple of things, which is, hey, look, your predecessor did a really nice job on building the overall brand and everything else. Um, no, no knock on her. She did a good job. Um, but there wasn't enough focus on the things that matter to us pipeline, bookings, revenue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even when you guys did talk about those things, you weren't even using our numbers. Yeah. That's gonna lead to a lot of problems, right? So I literally, before the end of my first quarter, recalibrated all of the discretionary goals for marketing that they got paid on around two metrics. It was around pipeline and bookings. The yeah. exact same metrics that sales was uh, being you, right? paid for. Funny right? Unbelievable what that did. So now when we're in meetings, we're having dialogue and we're discussing, all of a sudden we're talking about, well, our goals this quarter are to drive pipeline and do, to get bookings. Oh, that's the exact, right? Oh, right. So that does a lot to really make a difference, right? Goal alignment is the second thing. And then I think the third thing is there's got to be mutual respect on both sides to the job that's being done combined with a willingness to collaborate. Yes. Right. Because if, if you automatically, well, let's go back to the pitch deck that we were talking about. Right. If marketing creates a pitch deck with no involvement from sales, it probably isn't going to go very well. Mm. Right. So you, you've got to have a working team that is cross functional in nature. Right. Sales needs to respect the value add and the role that marketing's playing in this and that they own certain things and marketing needs to do it from sales. But there's good ideas to come from both directions. Right. And. So I, I think if you focus on those th three things, time horizon, awareness of it, education around it, discussion around it, that helps a lot. Goal alignment is really, really important. And then the third thing is you got to collaborate. And that starts with leadership, right? It, it's incumbent yeah. upon all of us to roll up our sleeves, be willing to have that dialogue, be willing to get people involved. I think those three things I would put front and center as the keys. I've seen it work very, very well. Um, and those things tend to be the foundation of being able to make that work. Yeah, look, I completely agree. Um, I, I can't tell you how many frustrating conversations I've had around goal misalignment. I'll, I'll be sitting in a meeting and I've got a dashboard with marketing telling me how wonderful the outcomes are. And then we get into a, uh, you know, an argument about the definition of an MQL and when it's an SQL. I think, you know, that's... Yeah. You know, that's, a, that's one side of it. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, uh, you're quite right as well that I think salespeople do need to respect the work of marketers more. I think uh, you know, salespeople sometimes fall into the trap of thinking they're the most important person on the planet. Um, they are a, an important part of the machine, but I think you, you need as a salesperson to respect and work with the, the people out there that are creating the awareness, filling the top of the funnel, because they're your lifeblood. And I think if you actually invest some time to understand what marketing is trying to do as a seller, you'll get a better outcome. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I've seen over the years some phenomenal partnerships in that. I'll tell you one of the things I've got to coach, you know, my marketing teams on all the time. And, and this will sound at the initial negative and it's not intended to be at all, but I, I've got to coach some people in marketing sometimes to say, you don't work for sales, you work with sales. We each have a role. We have shared and aligned goals. 
we each play a different part in doing that. We need to orchestrate those together and work towards those common goals. But we work together because, you know, a lot of salespeople have very strong personalities and strong opinions and everything. And then marketing people can immediately start to then question themselves and not play their role. And we need them equally playing a role in doing what they're good at combining that with everything that sales is good at, you can put those two together, you're gonna get a much, much better outcome. If it skews one way too far, it, that's not the best outcome that a company can get. So it, it does take leadership, coaching, and everybody playing their part. That's the way you're gonna get the best outcome. Yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting piece, Randy. You know, sales, and we've said this a few times on the podcast so far, where it's a, it's a unique game where you lose so much more than you win. And there's almost yeah. there's very few other paths, you know, career paths you can take or pastimes. If you were if you were in a football team or a baseball team where where you lost seventy percent of the time, you'd quit and do something else, right? <laughs> you'd have to be really passionate about the game. But yeah. in sales, like that, that's a good outcome. Yeah. And and so if if you think about the behaviors then of a marketing person, they might be losing on a regular basis, i.e., you know, eyeballs are seeing the ads or, you know, seeing the activities, but not reacting to them, but they don't experience it. They don't yeah. actually engage the with somebody and, and, and genuinely see halfway through a sales, halfway through a, you know, they're just seeing the statistics. They're not actually seeing the experience of the individuals. So I, I think like those human psychology pieces are important for, for sales and marketing to get a different understanding of each other. But, but then I also think that there's, and I'd love your opinion on this. I also think there's a, a, a lack of understanding from sales on what marketing's core job is. Marketing is not advertising. And, you know, marketing is about building markets. And and that's why, you know, we, we look at, you know, we talk about things in, in, in any sales process of, you know, what's the total addressable market or the TAN of a product? And that might vary between your products. It might vary between regions it might vary between segments um you know and so i think that's the piece that sales don't have a good appreciation sales people often don't have a good appreciation for is the job of a marketer is not necessarily just to build you the pitch deck so your next deal is going to go go more smoothly it's to build you an entire series of pipeline in order for you to have those engagements on an on and you said before on a long-term ongoing basis yep so I think those things are, are key. Go on. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think um, thinking about the market, there's actually a, a, a CMO group that I'm on. And one of the things that um, networking group in that one of the things they espouse is that chief marketing officer, in some respects, does a disservice. It should really be chief market officer, which I think, Dan, goes right to the point that you were making, right? It's, really. it's really about understanding the market um, it's really about the customer experience overall, right? And, and I genericize customer because it's really prospect and customer. You want that entire experience, right? Um, because at the end of the day, ultimately, it's around driving growth. That's everything that we're trying to do is to drive growth, right? And, you know, you talked about your, your TAM, for example. Well, part of that understanding the market, part of that ability to drive the growth is understanding what the total addressable market is, but also understanding what the ideal customer profile looks like, understanding who's in market for your solution and being more focused on getting in front of them and building awareness and then helping them move through. You know, one of the things I've always looked at, content is an important thing in marketing, right? Because people need content in order to answer their questions during the buying process. And fundamentally, what we want to be able to do is we want to identify who the right people are to be getting in front of, the right people that are in market from an account perspective and the various personas. And then depending on where they're at in the buying process, you want to feed them up the content that is pertinent and, and resonates for what they're trying to achieve at that part of the, the buying process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, going back to the buying committees and everything else, there could be multiple personas. An IT person's got a different lens on it than a finance person, than a salesperson in a buying process. So yeah. the more that we can understand and really understand the market, deliver that great experience, and have sort of the insights to understand 
who's in market, who are the personas, where are they at in the buying process, get them the information they need, give them a great frictionless experience through that, we're going to be a good partner to sales and helping to drive growth. And that fundamentally is what it's all about. Yeah, thinking through what you just described, and, and obviously most of our audience is based in uh, Australia, New Zealand, or in the APAC region. Um, as a CMO, you, you're looking after, uh, it's all about money, right? You, you've got a budget at the beginning of the year. You've got to place your bets. Um, you have a, a company that's looking to grow by X percent. Therefore, you know, as a, as a CMO, here's your budget to, to grow our market, drive pipeline, close deals, et cetera. Um, a lot of our listeners, um, sales leaders, sales people, we're sitting here in Australia. We, we know the CMO sitting somewhere in North America for most of the uh, software companies that you know I've worked for for the last sort of 10 years or, or Europe, et cetera. Um, as a sales leader, I've often come into a new year. Um, I've got big growth plans. My, my boss, who's typically the, the chief revenue officer, has told me to you know, add 40% to my number. We need to grow. Uh, and then sometimes there's a disconnect between how my targets are set, yet you as a CMO look globally and say, look, I need to put 90% of my funds this year into North America. Sorry, Asia Pac, you get 5%. And there you get five. It's not always that terrible. But how, how as a, a leader in Australia, do I go about giving you, a, as a, a global CMO, a perspective of what you need to do to invest in the Australian market? Because I think a lot of Australians in, this, in the sales game often feel uh, second or third or fourth or fifth in line for funding. How, how do we make a better case for spending money in our region? Yeah. So uh, I think there's two things that come to mind. The first and the foremost is, is like any other relationship, the more familiarity is, the more it's top of mind, right? Uh, and that's a dual, that's, that's not a one-way statement at all. That's a, that's a responsibility of the head of service, the head of marketing, the head of finance, the head of, right, of any group, um, as well as it is the people in region. So I think that familiarity is, is hugely valuable. I think the second thing is, is that what I've always strived for, um, and when Dan and I worked together, I think we had this decent, we weren't perfect yet, but it should be largely a fact-based discussion. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be you having to argue for it. The, the, the facts and the data should spit out that that investment should be there. And so what I've always tried to do, and we had a pretty good model for this, was you start with what the bookings goals are for the year. Right. And you take a look at what the bookings goals are, and then that usually goes into a quota allocation model, a QAM, right? And it starts to look at by segment, by geo, by right, by team and everything else, what the expectations are, which obviously for bookings, and then you can look at the growth goals from that, obviously. And then we've always created pipeline goals directly off of that. Yep. So we would look at, and you know, even getting down to if it's an existing customer versus a new customer, what are the conversion rates and therefore what's the coverage that we need and pipeline relative to bookings. So it's a, it's a big set of calculations, but you can get this pretty scientific, right? And starting to look at where should we be investing in that. And then once you get that number, then between sales and marketing, we can have a discussion that says, okay, well, the, I'm going to make up numbers. The, the number spits out, we're going to put 10% here. But we're, we, we need to invest some this year, so we're going to round that to 12% because, or 15 or whatever, right? Uh, because despite what the numbers tell us, for the various circumstances, we want to make an investment there, and we're going to pull some money and be able to do that. So, so I think, first and foremost, building the relationships, having that familiarity, having that regular dialogue so it's not just at the planning time is hugely advantageous. Secondly, the planning process itself should be formulaic to the point of getting you pretty good facts and data to understand based on the bookings and the bookings growth by geo, by segment, by team and everything else. Here's what pipeline I need. Here's what type of investment I need to be able to make. And then you can have a little bit of subjectivity around a discussion around, hey, because of the following circumstances, we're going to do a little bit of shift here and there, but it should be largely driven off of facts and data. Yep. Love it. Yeah. I think that's an important piece, Randy. I mean, if you look at uh, as a sales leader, you know, most sales that will, will come from inside a sales org. I've been an AE before, I've run some great deals and the, you know, someone at a point along the line says that, look, if you can get the rest of the team to do that, great, you get promoted and 
often is actually you lose a little bit of money till you make some more money. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, ma the maths of it, when, when, anyone thinking about doing that, going from being an AE to being a leader, do the maths properly. You may not, you may not make more money in the first instance, but it's about building a machine and it's about yeah. understanding the annual cycle for what that looks like. And the, the combination between, uh, you mentioned before, going from the short term to the long term, it's at least going from the short term to the medium term as a leader to understand how many people do I have? What do those people need to run at? At what level of efficiency or what level of sales productivity? You know, is another key driver here around, you know, uh, the 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 re the cost of their wages to the output they have for revenue. Then, what marketing input do I need to put in in order to generate the pipeline that they can actually build on? I, I'm, I've got a, a customer I'm helping coach at the moment, and talking her through the concept of how many deals can an individual rep run at one time yep um and if you go up the scale as in i, I grow the size of deal then the number of deals you can run actually comes down doesn't go up and and does so and so at what level does that ratchet so i'm actually not getting a better outcome from the person but i'm getting bigger deals is that what my company wants because we don't want to grow the customer success of a delivery org by three X. We want, we want to grow them at one and a half X for the next year. So we want to need to go. So all those things start to come into your model. And then you do different things with who you're marketing to or who you're building a market for and how you then advertise and promote to those to bring them into your pipeline. So I think like that's the key for me, a great sales leader. It's not just the coaching inside a deal. It's understanding that machine at the same time. I absolutely agree, right? It's about building things that, to the extent that you can get more predictability into the pipeline generation, the, the, to the extent that we're all gonna sleep a lot better, right? It's it, <laughs> getting the measurement, getting that machine in place that has some degree of predictability is hugely advantageous, right? Um, and if you think about it, from the selling side, sales teams have done a really good job over the years with tools and methodologies and processes around forecasting bookings, forecasting pipelines a hell of a lot harder, right? And most companies aren't nearly as good at it. So to the extent that you can pour energy into that and get better at that, we're all going to sleep a lot better because you can't get bookings without pipeline, right? You can't get revenue without bookings. You can't get bookings without pipeline. So all of those things need to be tied together. It goes back to that formulaic and, and getting to that. One other thing that I'll mention that you brought up, right? I also spend a lot of time trying to think about what's the ratio of people versus programs in marketing, right? Because, you know, marketing is of all the groups within a company has the highest percentage of discretionary budget of any group, right? Most other teams are people in like trap, right? Uh, we have this discretionary funds that we want to leverage for growth, right? Getting that balance of, well, what percentage of it is people versus programs and everything else is also important to think about, right? Because if, if you go too far in either direction, right? If you have way too many people, you don't have enough leverage in your model. There's not enough program dollars for those people to spend that's gonna give you the lift and the leverage that you need, right? Likewise, if you go the opposite direction and you have too many programs and not enough people, now you don't have the expertise to be able to invest that wisely and you're probably gonna get a poor return on it, right? Because you don't have the, the skill sets and the people to actually invest and manage that investment, put the measurement in place and put the adjustments in place that's always needed with these programs and that. So you, you gotta play around with that and, and really work hard to try to get that ratio right um, and figure out what that leverage point is for your business. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, that's something that we've done in the past where it's almost, we've talked about it in terms of like, where do you make your bets? Yeah. And, you know, particularly if you're in region and it might be, there's a scale, um, North America has, is able to run 10 programs this year or five programs, whatever, whatever the number be. But because of, you know, our comparative size, we can only execute maybe two of them well. Right. So yeah. what are our bets going to be? And then how do we, ed and back to, we we're talking about how do you get sales and marketing to work together? How do we then get our salespeople and our, our go-to-market motion, so expand it outside just the salesperson who's delivering this, how do you get your customer success person and your sales engineer um, and your delivery person, whoever it may be, to all be understanding the messaging so that when the customer gets the product, it aligns to what they thought they were buying from the market that we built. Yep. Um, but our bets aren't all of those. 
Uh, and then communicating back to the business that says, you know, back to your kind of uh, planning on the numbers and what's the spend. We know there are five motions that are happening in North America. We can't do three of them. We right. just don't right. have the dollars is actually more often than not, not actually the problem. It's the time and the effort. Yeah. I just don't have the people that can execute on those. So great. Thank you for bringing them to our attention, <laughs> but I, I can't do them. And I think so many, I mean, Simon, you know, we've got some great stories on this where early on we kind of probably didn't push back on some of those areas and we spread ourselves way too thinly and then were criticized by not executing any of the things well. And, you know, yep. what we did well afterwards was actually go back and say, listen, we're not going to do these three. Completely agree. I Look, I think, you know, it's when you first start leading a region or a big sales team and you're given – uh, a lot of cash to go spend on marketing the temptation is to hey i've got a ton of money can't hurt i'll go spend it but you know i think what what we learned is um it, it's if you're given five or six campaigns to go run it's better to actually nail two or three of them really really well uh and then you know potentially not spend everything you're given and have something in the hopper and uh, when it makes sense i think look i think the other thing is Certainly, in, the, in a small region like ours, um, we, we talked a little bit about collaboration before. Um, one of the big lessons I learned, and I think it's an advantage actually for um, you know ANZ or APAC over potentially North America, is you, you kind of know everybody in every role because we're a lot smaller. So I'll know the customer success people, the consultants, the solution engineers, the sales people, the marketers. And if we've got a program of work coming out that's being funded by marketing to go build pipe, um, very easily I can jump the silos of each of those different uh, parts of the business because we're typically sitting in the same office in, in a smallish uh, team. And so my, my customer success people know precisely what the campaign I'm running and, and when they're talking to customers, they'll actually raise the messaging, et cetera, for their customers and and talk directly to the salespeople. And I think huge advantage um, in, in a region our size um, to make sure those messaging messages go across. So if I nail two or three really well, go deep, um, I'm going to get a great return on investment. I'll probably have a CMO that rings me and says, how are you delivering uh, that marketing ROI and you're not even spending 100% of the dollars I gave you? Um, now, the, the flip side of that is, be careful about leaving money on the table because uh, we all know what uh, annual budgets are like. And uh, a, lo a lot of times, if you don't spend it, you don't uh, you go into the next year with a, uh, a net net negative uh, marketing spend. So, that, coming back to what you said, Randy, I think communication and relationship are, are absolutely fundamental in that. And, you know, if, if you and I have a conversation, Randy, you say, "Look, here, here's five million bucks to go spend in uh, ANZ in the next twelve months," and I say, "Look." Let's let's hone in on two or three programs, but I want to keep you posted, and I might only use two or three million of the five. But let's have that conversation going on. So when I say, "Hey, I've got this awesome opportunity," it's unplanned, but I've still got some money left. This is what the return is going to give you. We we can be flexible and um, you know be be malleable about how we execute. And I think the way you execute in EMEA versus North America versus ANZ, we're all subtly different, and you've got to be a little bit careful about that. I think. Yep. Actually, one, one question. Yeah, I'll, I'll give Dan props because one of the things I was really impressed that Dan would do is we, we had multiple products that we could sell. And I think he took a very holistic sort of customer centric long term view and said, look, we're not ready to sell these products yet. Yep. So why put any investment in them? We don't have the partners. We don't have the implementation. And had we gone down that route, just chasing things, I guarantee you, I'm sure his team probably would have sold a couple and they probably wouldn't have gone very well. Right. And then that is a really bad hole to get dug into, right? As you're entering a new region that you get some really unhappy customers with it, with an offering or whatever that's. So I really appreciated Dan looking at that longer term view, customer centric view, where to put the dollars that we could re get results today while we build out capability to go to some of the other products in the future. It's not that we didn't want to, we just weren't ready yet. And, and I think that co collaboration and that dialogue was really, really helpful to make sure that we didn't try to just take, oh, we're doing, I think Dan said 10 things in North America, we're gonna go do those 10 in, in uh, ANZ. We weren't ready to do half of those, even if we had the capability to, because we, we couldn't successfully implement and make those customers happy. And I, 
I think that was a really, really good outcome to not do that. Yeah, I, have to, I mean, Simon and I actually had to unpick some of that in a previous role, right, where we inherited a series of customers who had been sold products that the yeah. company 100% owned and could deliver the product. But it's a little bit like, you know, just the, the simple analogy. I can get you a car, but if you can't drive the thing, it's a lump of steel in the front of your yard. Yeah. What's the point? What's the point of having the car in the first place? And that is so really it, hard to recover from. Absolutely. And and really we, we we had to go the long way of actually taking an organization. And then it's a really hard conversation. Again, using the car analogy, it's a really hard conversation to go and have if you're if you're a, a, a an auto dealer that I need to go and build a petrol station. Hold on, we sell cars. What do you mean you need to build a petrol station? <laughs> well, the nearest petrol station from here is a thousand is a thousand miles away. Um, and our cars only have 600 mile range. <laughs> range. Um, the cars get here and they've got no petrol. <laughs> it's, it's, Sounds like you're selling an EV now. <laughs> uh, but if, whatever it may be, right? But the, but but that's the experience, and I think, and that that that's a that's when marketing and delivery and everybody. What's the market? What's the deliverable? How does yep. a customer get to the end, not to the beginning of the process? And so many that's right. salespeople fall afoul of that, which is. You know, we've all been in those organizations where delivery and sales hate each other because sales keep kicking over the fence, these shitty deals that no one yep. likes, but hey, I, I booked it, it's booked, yep. it's in. Um, no, no, it's not booked because I've had to give back 50% of the revenue because the customer can't use the stuff that we sold them and I'm not going to court every time to try and get the money back, right? That's so, right. but I mean, it, and this kind of segues into the the next conversation that I know we wanted to talk about, which is, Building building a pipeline, building the number of organizations you can talk to is tip, like typically falls into some sort of business development function. Every organization calls them something different. And there is always this tension. And I reckon in my sales career, I've been asked this question a hundred times by different either organizations or startups. Where does BD sit? And and I and I and I don't have a good answer to this question. And I've seen organizations put business development in marketing. I've seen organizations put it in sales. I've seen organizations spin it out as their own piece, you know, own equation. And and I walking through the logic of you know the pluses and the minuses of of doing it either way, I would love to get your opinion of the 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 benefits, but then also the real challenges of BD sitting in marketing. Um, and then I think we can discuss, you know, vice versa, what does it look like in, in sales the other way? What are your thoughts on that? I think it can work either direction and I think it can fail miserably in either direction. And let me explain what I mean by that, right? Because I, I think where it sits is actually less an issue and more of the leadership, the structure, the discipline, the roles and all of that being defined as more of the issue because I've seen it work in both, right? So I think the first thing is what's their charter? Is it securing meetings or is it inside sales? Or is it both? If the charter of this group, and again, whatever you call them, I agree, BDRs, SDRs, whatever you want to call them, right? If the charter of this group is to secure meetings, then don't let people turn them into sales inside sales reps, mm -hmm. right? That are doing grunt work for the field reps, right? Because now they're not doing their charter. And that's one problem that you can have if they report to sales. Believe me, if they report to marketing, the same problem can happen if you don't have the right leadership, discipline, structure, and everything else. It can be exacerbated a little bit if they're in sales. But I think number one, defining the charter is really important. I think number two is clarity of who's giving them direction. You know, where I've seen it go bad in the past is when the SDR, BDR, or whatever is getting direction from their manager, the AE that they work with, the AE's manager, the marketing team, the, right? And there's no clarity of who's giving them direction. Now that doesn't mean that direction can't get inputs from all groups, but it's got to be channeled and clearly communicated, not coming from all groups, coming into the management team that gives clarity of purpose and direction and, and clarity to them, right? You start pulling them in a million different directions, it goes all over the place, right? I think understanding sort of, are they inbound, outbound, or are they doing a little bit of both? What's their purpose, right? So the inbound stuff is generally working on marketing source generated stuff and the outbound stuff hopefully is not doing cold calling. Hopefully they're 
reaching out to accounts that are in market and you know you've got some engagement with and 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 so on and the proper metrics to be able to make sure you've got that the other thing that's really hugely important is the business development roles and responsibilities and rules of engagement relative to the ae mm-hmm. right of when are things handed over if somebody comes back in when do they retain ownership of it versus it goes you know round robin and gets go right there's a whole bunch of rules of engagement. To me, all of these things, what are their goals? What are their charters? What are their rules of engagement? Where are they getting direction from? Getting all of that stuff defined, clearly communicate in that is so much more important than which group it sits in. Yep. Because I've seen, if that is clearly defined, I've seen it work in marketing, I've seen it work in sales. And I've also seen where that stuff's not clear and you've got all those things happening. It really doesn't matter where it reports to. It's going to struggle because these poor people are getting pulled in a million different directions with lack of clarity, right? Um, You know, lack of purpose and everything else. So I think there, there are some subtle pros and cons to being in, right? The inbound stuff, if it's in marketing, is probably going to get, you know, it's not going to be ignored. Um, You've got, you know, that outbound focus with the reps, if it's a part of sales, it is, you know, in portion, it is a sales oriented role, but it, it sort of, it sort of sits on the fence between the two. And that's why I think at the end of the day, it can work in either it's getting those other things right to me is more important than physically where it sits. And ultimately at the end of the day, that's because at the end of the day, if these groups aren't working together with clarity of purpose, how those are orchestrated, it really doesn't matter where it sits. It's going to fail anyway. Spot on. Spot on. I, um, I've got a question uh, that sort of pops up out of that. Um, we've got a, in the last five or so years, I've noticed the number of tools available to marketers and, and to sales people to be quasi marketers is, is exploded. Um, I, I won't mention the tools by name, but there are you know there are tools that we're expecting our salespeople to use that look at their territory and say who's engaged on my website, who's engaged, who, yeah. who's in an active buying cycle, etc. Now that's obviously the holy grail. You as a salesperson, you want to know who's moving and who's doing what. And that to me, those sort of tools are very much blurring the lines between early stage sales process and marketing process. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts around those tools that, you know, I think have become fairly ubiquitous in the last five years, very, very different to being a seller 10 years ago. Is, is this something that you, you like yeah. as a marketer? Is it, how does that impact, um, you know, how you succeed? Love them. Um, I, I, I think that is absolutely where we're going, right? Because they acknowledge a couple of different things. They acknowledge that number one, it's about accounts and buying committees. So they sort of take that traditional lead paradigm in that, um, and they flip it on its head and it's about account based. And those tools fundamentally are trying to help you do more account centric activities, go to market activities at scale. And to me, that's the way people buy today, right? It's accounts buy, people on at work, those accounts are part of the buying committee and they they ultimately are the buyers, right? And those systems are good at that, right? They also take into account what we talked about earlier, right? That the buying process today is very complex. People can do a lot of research in what's called the dark funnel out there, right? Doing a lot of research without telling you who they are yet, right? These technologies help you identify who's in market and everything else. So going back to what we talked about earlier about identifying who your TAM is and who your ideal customer profile is and who your in market ideal customer profile accounts are in that, very, very advantageous. Yeah. The ability to orchestrate the sales and marketing activities to those in market accounts, to the personas that we know are part of the buying team and give, give them personalized messages based on where they're at in the buying journey, very, very, very hard to do without the right technology, yep. right? Exactly. So, you know, these these technologies can help you do that. So I think everything that we've seen, the evolution of the buying slash selling process now in the B2B world, these tools are are the new paradigm of how you go about addressing them. So I'm actually a big, big believer in them. I think they're highly advantageous. I don't think 
the overwhelming majority of organizations have gotten there yet and fully figured it out. We're going to probably stumble a couple of times as we figure this out. But I believe their ability to leverage AI and leverage their sort of predictive analytics in that is absolutely the direction that we need to be going. Account centric, right? Everything that I just said, I think is absolutely where we need to go. And we need to all lean in and figure out how to perfect these and, and make them work within our businesses. Big believer. And, and I think they can be a unifier between sales and marketing because it's all about orchestrating our collective activities to identify those accounts in market, move them through the process and ultimately generate growth. And these tools can help facilitate these two groups working together better. And by the way, a third group would be customer service, customer experience teams. Yep. Uh, I think they're critically important, especially for existing customers, obviously. So yep. I, I'm a big believer. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Randy. I heard a, a colleague talk about this the other day that there are kind of three different types of leads that we see there's inbound someone has heard about you wants to buy from you there's outbound i've gone to you and then there's nearbound and and i think all of those dark web models focus on the nearbound and what i mean by nearbound is i'm in the market to buy something that you probably sell but i'm not quite sure yet i don't either i don't know about you but i'm in your market Whereas true outbound is not only am I not, did I not know that I'm in your market yet, I didn't even know that I had a problem that you solve and you go and create that problem. And I think enterprise teams in particular have been exceptional for a long period of time at doing inbound or true outbound. Mm -hmm. What they're not good at is understanding that nearbound market. Um, because they don't, you know, the experience often in that nearbound piece is someone hit me with an RFP. My competitor has already been looking yep. and I miss the start of this race. <laughs> you know, everybody else is at the 50, 50 yard line and I'm still putting my shoes on at the blocks <laughs> and you pass those ones by. And I think that technology is, is definitely going to change that space of understanding that buying committee has been formed. And all of a sudden a whole bunch of people started looking in my space. Okay. Now, how, now how do I start to really differentiate that that outbound messaging to to get in early and have those conversations where I need to, um, because I think we're we're so much. I know myself as an enterprise seller, I'm designed to contact if I'm selling marketing tech, contact a CMO and create an opportunity where it just didn't exist yesterday. That's that's where I'm. That's where I have my best outcomes. Often they're the biggest deals. They take the longest, but they're they're often the you know I have built a market specifically for the problem that I solve. Whereas the nearbound tech, it becomes an interesting way of, of using all these, these insights to really identify what I'm, what I'm solving and what I'm selling. Yeah. I, I think the promise of these technologies are, and I'll make some simple examples, right? Let's say that you're Tam, there's a thousand accounts that you could be selling to. Right. And of them, there's 500 of them that are really your ideal customer profile, right? That really fit based on who you've sold to in the past. At any one point in time, the, the statistics are there's, you know, 5% of them are actually in market at any one point in time. So I think what the statistics are bearing out so far is of the 500 that are your ideal customer profile, if only, let's say it's 5% of them are in market at any one point in time, do you wanna be cold calling into the 95% or do you wanna be warm calling into the 5%? Yep. And what the promise, the conversion rates obviously should be a heck of a lot higher if you're getting to that 5%, you're not, you know. Um, so I think, and I, I made up numbers for the point of illustration, right? But I, I think the promise of this technology is, is if I can take my in-market ICP and that's where I sick my outbound people, the odds of them, and, and those were people that were starting to go in market for your solution, but haven't exposed themselves to you yet, right? Because people don't fill out forms, people do a lot of their research on their own well before they come to you, right? So if I can get in earlier with those people that are actually in market versus the 95% that could buy for me in the future, but they don't have an active project at all, I'm gonna have so much higher conversion rates by focusing on those ones that if you can get to them early enough, obviously, um, that's the promise of it, right? It's, it's more, it's an efficiency trade-off, right? That you're, it's instead of, you know, um, spray and pray, it's actually a much more targeted specific to people that are in market and that you can go directly to them. So 
Randy, I'll jump in there, mate. Um, so I guess a question yeah. uh, as we sort of get to the top of the hour, um, you know, we've talked about tools, we've talked about targeting earlier. Um, just your, your two cents worth on what's about to change with AI in this space. I, I would imagine um, your basic analytics, you know, your scouring the web for who's looking, et cetera. I think, you know, AI should probably take us at another giant leap forwards. I don't think it fundamentally changes the role. I think it makes it way more efficient and targeted. Yep. Because fundamentally, going back to what we've talked about earlier, right? Marketing's job is ultimately to understand the market, understand and create that great customer experience to identify who is uh, possible to buy the technology and get in front of them with content and information they need to help them move through the process. Fundamentally, none of that change. It's how we do it and how efficient yep. we are and how effective we are at doing it. A another great example, you know, taking a slightly different where I think the same thing applies is generative AI is all over the place now, right? Yep. So, you know, there, there's some people out there that are talking about, well, generative, generative AI should allow me to, you know, maybe cut back on the number of people I have. Why would it do that as your default reaction, right? What it allows us to do is to more efficiently and more effectively go after a bunch of stuff that we've been trying to do. One of the biggest challenges that every marketing department I've ever managed has is we always want to go to market by vertical or by persona, by whatever. You know how hard it is to do that at scale? Yeah. To create content for all of them and then to personalize. It's, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people live in fantasy land that we're going to be able to create all of these completely personalized. If you think about the, the matrix and combinations of all the things that we're talking about, it's very hard to do at scale. But all of these tools that we're talking about, this AI can help me now start to do that and do it at scale in a much more efficient way. So I can get a productivity boost now for my content people that have been creating content maybe generically, and now I want to create verticalized versions of it. I haven't been able to do that because I haven't had the resources. Well, now generative AI gives me a boost in efficiency and able to actually start to tax some of that stuff. That's so great. I look at these things as not fundamentally changing the role of what marketing is doing, but dramatically in transforming the efficiency and the effectiveness by which we do the things that we need to do. That's, that's why that's I'm awesome. so bullish on it, right? I've, I've spent yeah, a yeah. lot of time over the last several weeks in that really digging into this. And I'm, I'm a huge advocate of the value that they can deliver in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. It's, it's exciting times to come. Who knows? We may one day get to our four day work. Very week. excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might hand over to you, Dan. I think we're at the top of the hour. Oh, he's lost his uh, voice. Look, uh, Randy, as we, um, I guess, the, the top of the hour, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on uh, the podcast. I think, honestly, your insights have been fantastic. And it's always lovely to hear um, from a, a CMO around what, um, you know, what sellers do, how we can improve. You've given some, some great insights. I think, for me, some of the key takeaways are, it's, it's all about collaboration. We need to talk to each other. We need to understand yeah. what we're doing. There's a lot of great new tools out there that we should be taking advantage of. Um, but I think fundamentally it comes down to, as a sales guy, I need to understand what you do in marketing. And as a marketing person, uh, you need to understand what we do. We need to align. We need to talk. And it's, you know, it's not rocket science. We just need to work together. So, Randy, again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on the, the Growth Pulse pod podcast. Um, for those listening, um, please um, like us, share, uh, tell, tell your colleagues about what we do.